The construction of a captive environment for a pack of wolves, it's not as easy as people think. It's not just a case of putting a fence around that's high enough to contain them, low enough to stop them digging out. It does go much deeper than that. And we believe that the environment you put them into, regardless of size, should be a natural part of their world and enriched accordingly. So these are some of the things that we do finally to try and keep our guys active. We get them all firstly to learn how to drive a digger. No, we don't. <laughs> what we need to do is we need to build a natural environment around them. The fence line itself with our guys, um, we're up to about a metre and a half, two metres in height. It always has to have an overhang. Wolves are incredible jumpers. And if the pressure gets hard and they go into what we call dispersed mode, which is an animal leaving the pack for whatever reason, they will very quickly and identify many weaknesses within the fence itself. The biggest problem with containing wolves comes from what's under the ground. So we always put our wolves or wolf fencing down four feet down, what's that about, just over a metre down, and at least six feet out, so about a metre and a half out. The idea then is the animal has to dig out and under, and they can't do that in the time scale that it takes us to do our last security check and our first one the following morning. So digging is the biggest priority with wolves, and they can do it very quickly and tremendously efficiently. The fencing itself, rather than the traditional square that you'll see on many of the enclosures today, we also believe that the, square, the, the enclosure itself should take the form or shape of what we call an offset circle, almost like an egg shape. Now, wolf packs in the wild, probably, based on this circle of development, will almost have that type of shape in their territorial boundary. So, by us doing that, because there's no corners in nature, it tends to make them a lot more acceptant of the area that we put them into. They will do a full territorial boundary, rather than the traditional pacing up and down that we've come to be accustomed to, and accustomed to um, stress. Okay, cool. Fantastic. The denning area itself, beautifully displayed here by Noose, one of our males coming out. The reason why we're showing you this one is that we believe with wolves and dogs, the denning area is the key to what keeps them um, safe and secure within our home environment. The problem we actually have is you can see he's struggling to get out of this narrow passage, and that's absolutely perfect for a wolf. A wolf's natural line of defence is to get into somewhere very narrow and very dark where they can back in and anything that's going to come down there after them is going to come down one at a time, it's not going to be bigger than them, and it's going to come directly onto their jaws or onto their teeth. That's how a wolf naturally defends itself. If we've got four other wolves wanting to kill that animal, then it can't defend itself against that amount of animals. So, getting down a hole means that only one animal will come at a time. So if we take that principle on board now, if that's what a wolf thinks is naturally defensive to it, what can we as people do, particularly children, to agitate a wolf or a dog, in this case, into becoming defensive? We've done a big talk on this one about the amount of casualties and fatalities that come from young people around animals these days. Can anybody think now what would cause a dog to attack a child based on this principle? What could a child do? to get an animal to be defensive. If that's a natural defense of a wolf, what can a child do to a dog that would bring up a natural defensive quality? Anybody think? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, good one. Yeah, basically about there. Imagine this. Imagine I'm a young child. Imagine I was my mum. What do we teach young children to do when they haven't seen mum for a while if they've been at school all day? What they'll do is the arms will come out, they'll do a big smile, and they'll rush up to mum. <laughs> exactly the reverse of that. You've got a set of weaponry or teeth coming out of a narrow passage. If they do that to some dogs, it will bring out natural defensive qualities in the animal. Anybody wear the traditional hoodie? Yep, yeah, you got one? Got one there? Yep, yeah, one of those. Imagine a hoodie on a child. Hood comes up, it's a dark area, very narrow passage, with a set of weaponry coming out of it. And you start to see how some of the problems in our daily life, particularly connected around young people, can cause a problem in some dogs where it will bring up natural defensive qualities. Some dogs in our homes will have a problem with what we call anxiety, separation anxiety. The reason behind that is that they don't often have this narrow passage. Often our doorways are large enough to get anything the size of a horse through. In some animals, particularly the lower ranking animals that have had trauma connected around separation and anxiety would be a massive problem if the doorway itself 
was a big area. We often find that they will shred or strip things that they feel that are going to be safe to them. Um, normally in the form of scent that would come from either the male or the dominant figure in the house, and it would be shredded in an area that actually separates the doorway from where they're resting. One of the ways to stop that is a nice, narrow, dark passage. The dogs will often do it themselves, where you'll see some dogs that display this behaviour will get the, then, then the back of a sofa where it's nice and dark and nice and narrow, and they will probably actually reverse or back in. Again, exactly the same principle as the wolf, it's coming out onto the set of weaponry. Okay, natural enhancement for these guys. We've done an awful lot of research over the years on containing wolves in areas of the wild, particularly Poland, Finland, Russia, and the States. One of the most successful ways that we've found of containing this animal is using its own language against it. This wonderful howl that we've all come to know and love. We actually did a survey out in the States and we found that more young people are actually afraid of the noise that the wolf makes than they ever are of the creature itself. Probably because it's connected to every horror movie we ever see. <laughs> Traditionally, it's simply a language used over distance. Exactly the same as you guys picking up a mobile phone and calling a friend and a loved one. That's all it means for the wolf. It's effective up to about 10 miles away on open ground, 5 to 6 miles in dense forest area, and it is their way of communicating. It's also a fantastic way for enriching male wolves in a captive environment. Our belief is that rather than having one large pack, we should enhance two or three smaller packs that can all communicate with one another. It's a beautiful enrichment for children and public to come down and see, and it also creates the defensive quality and family security in these guys that they need to defend what's theirs. Um, we thought it'd be nice actually to finish, if anybody's up for it, we'll give you a demonstration of all the different types of howl. We'll create a pack of wolves and hopefully you guys will understand a little bit about what we do to contain them in a wild environment. So we're going to need about five volunteers. If you don't volunteer, I will come pick you, so there's much difference anyway. So. Any volunteers, males or females, stop okay. sleeping down there, we'll pick them straight away. Okay. 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 Okay.